Dating Unsettled. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Dating Unsettled show where we dare to date differently. This episode is called Surviving the Split. And we have a very special guest with me, with you, with us, we, you and I together. There's a guest that's here for us. And it is Bridget Finister. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Just that roll. Oh yeah. <laughs> Doesn't it feel uncomfortable to be clapped for it for does. a very long time? Like, hey Bridget. Especially how you doing? The, the fake claps. <laughs> I am <laughs> hanging in there. I'm hanging in there. And sometimes that's all we can do. Surviving the split is very particular. This episode was designed for you, titled for you, we're creating a stage for you because you went through the breaking of an engagement and the end of a relationship that was very meaningful to you. I think that this is something a lot of people will relate to. Um, This is also some people's worst fear. Um, But at the same time, the levels that you got to of commitment, of giving yourself to someone are people's greatest aspiration. So at the same time, it's just incredible because you have a story that is hurtful, that is painful, that is tragic, but that is also aspirational of the way that you've like carried yourself through it. So I would love to read a little bit of your blog post that you shared from Faith Filled Femme. Okay, so Bridget shares, I never thought that this would be my stories. Oh, okay, start again. Bridget says, I never thought that this would be my story. I cannot tell you how many years I pray to God to bring me a man after his own heart, one that would love and cherish me as he would himself, one that would honor me. So when I discovered his infidelity, I choked. And when he blamed it on me, I died. You say nobody is safe from heartbreak. I allowed myself to be blamed for all of it. I just had to prove it to him. I had to prove that I was enough, that this was a mistake. But instead, I proved to myself that I did not love, honor, or cherish me and the woman God made me to be. You go on to talk about how this situation brought out the ugly, how you are fighting for you. You felt like a failure, but better yet, now you're focused on who you're helping. That if you're only ever posting the highlight reels, who is going to get the real deal? And how can you be encouraged when you think you are the only one going through it? And now you are affirming women that you are worthy just by being you. <sighs> Ooh, that's a lot when I hear it rip. <laughs> Can you imagine when I read this? I mean, like I have chills now reading it back and this is me paraphrasing y'all. So if you visit the faithfilledfem.com, you can read Bridget's entire account of how her engagement uh, dissolved and how she fought through that. I'm so glad that you're here now. How does it feel hearing those words back, hearing your story read through somebody else who's affected by it. If I'm being honest, it feels surreal. It does not feel like that's my story. And I'm like, dang, that happened to me. <laughs> oh my God. Is she okay? <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at yourself like you on the outside. You're like, can I give I, her a hug? <laughs> I know. I'm like, dang, like that was a lot. Like it feels, I think sometimes when we're going through stuff, you're looking through a lens of not realizing the the magnitude of what you're going through until somebody else says, and you're like, oh my gosh, like yeah. how am I managing? How am I going through it? So that's kind of where, where I'm like, we're hanging in there and I'm not sure how or why, but we are. That's some incredible <laughs> strength. You, I want to, I want to take people to the top of your dating story. So even before we're entering the situation where there's an engagement, where you're moving on, I want to take people way back to you. What type of dater were you in those days where you could, you know, remember that you kind of just started dating and looking for a relationship? Tell us what type of dater you were. I I wasn't somebody that dated a lot of people, to be honest. I definitely always ended up finding somebody that was within my network. And when I found somebody that I liked, we would just decide to be in a relationship. So like I said, never a serial dater, not dating around, but I was very like, okay, I'm going to be in a relationship with this person and then we're just going to work it out and see how it goes. And so it might've lasted two years. It might've lasted six months, but we were in it. We were in it to win it, Um, which I found was a little bit dangerous because 
I wasn't looking at people and saying, this is the guidelines I was looking for. Do they match those? It was, let me find the person and then try to match the guidelines to the person, which is a little bit scary. Mm, interesting. You're working backwards a little bit. Mm-hmm. You're very much like a monogamous dater. You're a yeah. one man woman. Okay. And mm-hmm. would you say that you were like a romantic or optimistic type of dater or a little oh, bit? Oh, absolutely. More? Okay. Oh, I was so, I was definitely the romantic, definitely the optimistic. Um, and not every person that I dated was that. And so I really tried to put the ideals that I had in my head on that person. I was like, if they love me, they will turn into this. I feel <laughs> very attacked right now. I feel very much, very yeah. much like I would like to hide. That's, you're calling a lot of people out right now. Like you're a scenario creator. You look at this person's picture. You're like, cool. I've already mapped out our next 18 dates. Yep, I'm yeah. active in our life. I know how this is going to work. You're going to fit in. It's going to be fabulous. Yeah, and if it's not, like, we'll, fix, we'll fix it. Period. Mm-hmm. Okay, so recognizing that faith is central to your dating story and to the place that you find yourself in now, what did you pray for? What was the prayer for you? You know, I will say I got to the point um, before I dated my ex fiance. Um, I actually had a dating coach and somebody that just kind of really helped me like solidify like where I was at in life. And I did. What? I know I did. I see your face. Back it I, up. Did. Back, I did. Back, I did. I had a dating up. coach. And yeah, she focused on helping high achieving women of faith basically become who they needed to become so they can attract the love that they wanted. And so we did a lot of self work and focusing on our values, our goals, who we are, what we want. And so I did have a list. Like I knew exactly what I wanted. And number one on my list was kind hearted, uh, God fearing, honest. Um, and then, you know, like the, obviously the other things were like tall, you know, handsome, black chocolate, you know, we love those things too, but um, it was really like, like that kind hearted piece. I had dated people in the past who, you know, had tempers who were angry and dealt with that kind of thing. And I was like, that's, I don't want that. And I know if I can find a man who's kind hearted, he's got the fruit of the spirit. Our relationship will do a lot better if, if, if that runs through. So I was really looking for just like a good hearted man. Yeah, that makes sense. And it doesn't seem outrageous. Like, I don't know if you've ever watched like an Indian matchmaking and they go through people's like checklists and it's yes. like, oh, okay, we're really pushing it. That sounds like a really basic list. Mm -hmm. Now you find yourself in a place where the prayer manifested. Talk to me about the moments for you where you felt like, aha, I found what I was looking for. How did that feel? Yeah, when it it felt like, oh my God, I can't believe like I'm actually matching up the things on the list, the, the, the important things on the list. And then also the not important things on the list. Not only did I think that I found like, you know, intelligent and successful and kind and all those things, but I also found attractive and over six feet and, you know, certain income, like those types of things. I was like, oh, this is the best of both worlds because I don't have to sacrifice anything. Like, and I was like, oh my God, it's really happening. Like it literally felt like a dream, something I had really worked for and like thought he was on the same page with me. And I'm like, this is amazing. Our story is written. They're going to write books about us. This is it. It's happening. And then you were unsettled. Yeah. And then I was unsettled. And I was like, this was not in the plans. Wait a minute. This not in the plan. Do you do you feel like there is I hear you and I see you laughing a little bit right now. Do you feel like there is laughter in the pain of seeing that dream dissolve? Or I mean you you said it much deeper. You said you died. Do you feel like there's laughter in that type of pain? Or do you think laughter is going to take you a while? Um, I think I can find moments where I'm like, what was I thinking? You know, when you, when you think back at certain decisions you made or certain things you saw and now in hindsight, I'm like, oh shoot, I saw that or I thought that, or I felt that. And now I'm putting the pieces together and I'm, that was my fault for like, just <laughs> deciding to, to turn a blind eye. So I can laugh at, laugh at those things. There's some stuff that it's going to take me a minute. It's going to take me a minute because it was just like a lot, but I can think I can find moments where I was acting foolish. Like girl, like you were really, I was trying to hold on to something that was gone. It was gone. If you feel comfortable, what were some of those moments? And only if you do, if, if you feel comfortable, what were some of those moments for you that you look back now and you're like, okay, pick me McGee. Okay. Boo, boo. Like, do you, do you have moments where you are laughing at yourself and what, what are they? Yeah, it was like when, 
when you when you find the the evidence, like you see, like what the person has done, and like the lie is there, like it's there. We both know it's there, <laughs> and they're like still denying that it's happening. And you're like, but we both are seeing it. But it's like, but if I just keep lying more, maybe yes. she, she won't like. <laughs> Do you know what's so interesting to me about that? You you are like a very creative person. Obviously, you are like a professional dancer in the sports industry. Uh, you're a dancer on your own with or without the team. Like you, you market and brand yourself like nothing I've ever seen when it comes to like your different offerings. You are obviously creative. It is funny to me. It's so funny and sad. It's funny to me how us romantic creative girls, you can look at a lie and you can convince yourself like, but no, you know, this is something yeah. different. Do you think that that creative power of Romanticiz- roman- romanticization. Yeah, that's a word. Do you think that, that creative power of you being romantic and wanting to see the best factored into how you viewed the state of your relationship? I think I was very, I was very tied to the outcome and I was very attached to this life that I had convinced myself we had already, which is interesting because I had a conversation with, with some friends, some therapists, and they're like, the life that you were attached to hadn't even happened yet. Wow. Because we weren't even, we were not married. We were not married, but I was, I already married to the idea of being married and it hadn't even taken place. And I was just like, no, don't take it away. Like, you know, and and it's kind of scary. I was like so tied to that outcome that I was willing to circumvent what was going on. I was willing to ignore what was happening. I was willing to be like, well, we can work through it. We can fix it so that I can keep us on the track to hit the thing that I had not gotten yet, but I was promised yeah. it, but I hadn't gotten it yet. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> there was a target. In- <laughs> I just, I, I, if y'all are watching my video, I'm sitting here looking stunned and stupid. I'm just like, wow. Like, I feel like I'm doing, you know, red tableness, but like for real, there's something to attaching yourself to an outcome as opposed to the reality of what you are in and how that can drive you. And it's a blessing and it's a gift because that is what has allowed you to be so ambitious. That is what has allowed you through grief, through pain, like unrelated to this, because I've been following you for a bit Mm -hmm. to continue to persevere. But it's interesting how that trapped you in a sense, like in a state you have been very public about I, relatively public, I'll say, actually, you're not very public, you're not spilling your business, but you've been yeah. relatively public about what you've experienced, especially through this blog post. When you wrote, I am sacrificing my own privacy and pride to hopefully save a soul and a life. I'm wondering, how did you think about being on Instagram while you were engaged and sharing the joy of your relationship? You know, I was 50-50 with it, to be honest, because part of me was, like, very excited and happy because I'm like, this is great. Found this man. I love him, and I want to show the world. But then also half of me was like, but what if it doesn't work? And also, you know, I realized that a lot of these people that were championing us were also a lot of the people who were in the inbox once they saw that I was no longer in the picture. No. No, yeah, no, no, no people, no, 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 no. not not my not my friends, but there was just a line of, there's a, always a line of women. And there's always a line. Is, I don't know what it is about like men who are committed to an, another woman. Women, it just seemed like it's, they want a more. And it just was like, we can't wait till she does something to get out the picture so that we can be next in line. And it just, part of me was just like, I didn't want to make it public because, you know, it just, it just makes things even more delicate. You know, we can't really operate and deal with things if something happens like, you know, privately because it's very public, but You know, my ex-fiance was very much into the very public display of social media and pictures and Instagram couple and all of that. And I, to be honest, struggled with that a little, a lot. (laughs) That's, it's so interesting that the person who ended up, who ended up hurting you was the one who was willing to be most visible to others. Uh, How did you feel as a more, are you, do you consider yourself an introvert? I think I'm an extroverted introvert. I, yeah, I'm, a, I'm, it's funny because I'm a lot more private than people would think. Cause I've shared a lot of stuff online, but I, I feel like you're right. Like it was very frustrating to me to feel like, why did you tote me around the world? Why did you put me on stage? Why did you introduce me to all these people? Why did you do all these photo shoots and these videos and these, and then we're, was doing that behind 
closed doors. And it just was like, what was the point of all of that? And I think that's where my biggest frustration was because I can understand a dog, a dog who's like, yo, like, I'm not going to claim you. I'm not going to post you. I'm like, okay, so we kind of know what this is. Like, I've been there, done that. Oh, I thought we you know meant, what that looks like. Why did I think you were going to say, I can understand posting and sharing about your dog? I was like, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, people are pretty open about their dogs. No, you know, some some men who are just like, I'm not going to post you at all. Like, and we had even talked about that. He had never really posted a woman in the way he had posted me and showed me off and really made the world see like, this is my fiance. This is my life. So I'm like, wow, I don't understand why you why anybody would go through all the trouble to then be doing what they were doing behind closed doors unless you just never thought you would get caught. Or I don't know. I don't know. I'm still, I still don't understand. I don't understand. Yeah. You're still working through it. And I appreciate that you're here sharing with us, even though (laughs) it's very fresh, you know, for you and you're thinking about it. It is, it is like a blessing that we have a platform. I think, you know, Instagram, all these platforms that allow us to share like the most personal parts of ourselves. And I talked about this in the New York times, how with hard launch, which was a web series that I created to show off my partner. I wanted to flex this love. I wanted to flex the pursuit. Um, I wanted to inspire anybody that thought, oh, I'm not going to find love online. They just don't make them anymore. You know, all these sort of like tired tropes. I was like, by me speaking up about being this young Nigerian woman who's looking for love, somebody else is going to see that and be like, you know what? Let uh, let me dust off the old apps and hop back. You know, I knew that it could do that for some girls. And it's cool because that's the exact reaction that I got. And that's what happened. Um, I think even for men who are like, oh, you know, I don't know what type of place I'm in. I'm not from here. Am I going to find somebody? It's validating for them too. If they pay attention mm-hmm. to my partner and like his story, it is awesome that all of that can happen online. And at the same time, you do think with like every little post, huh, you know, what if I had to start over? What if I had to, and as I'm, as I was sharing from my last relationship going into this one, I was so it took me five years before I posted him on my main account. <laughs> so I was Ooh. the dog. <laughs> like, I was I was the one who was like, look, don't know if you get the real estate. Like it took me a while. And then even when I did, it wasn't as my partner. I just posted him in like a photography series. If you know, you know, if you don't know, you don't need to yes. know. That being <laughs> said, that's a relationship where like, I felt like I was going to be judged because we were from different races. Then I come into Ooh. black love and there's something about, Hashtag black love. <laughs> and everybody loves it. We love it. We all love it. We want to see it. It's fabulous. It's wonderful. We just it drink great. it like chocolate milk with so cocoa was, puffs. Floating. I was sitting in here like just marinating. I was I loved it. I did. Marinating I did. like a chicken. There's something about loving a black man that's just like nothing nothing you will ever do. <laughs> 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 no, but seriously, like I love that man. Like, and I still do love that man. Period. Wrap that up. And sometimes, and it's sometimes it's period. It's wrapped up. Like, yeah. What I love hearing from you is that you're still having these moments of like delight and happy and mm-hmm. pleasure over the things that made you delighted and happy and brought you pleasure. Like the Mm -hmm. end what's interesting to me the end of a relationship does not signal that everything that happened within that relationship is garbage now or the entire memory is destroyed you had some beautiful images beautiful pictures powerful moments and that's what that's just us on the outside like i saw y'all having a good time looking beautiful looking wonderful but in the in the same vein you experienced that and you were having a good time. <laughs> you you did look yeah, beautiful. Yeah. You did go on these vacations, the fake shoot that I thought was a real wedding to which I was like, um, I don't know if I should congratulate. But you had these like awesome moments. And so I love that the end of it doesn't completely destroy, you know, or sour, like the memory of everything that you had, even if it's like slightly tainted. It's like, I go back through, you know, pictures, you know, from previous relationships, interactions. I'm like, hmm, yeah, that was nice. Or I liked how I felt in that moment. Because I am a participant in what happened, devoid for, you know, absent of anything else that what that per absent of anything else that that person brought to the experience or the situation. Like I was an active player in my story. I was an active character in my story and me, we, myself and I, we had a good time. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about that. Cause I, I feel, I agree with you on that part, but then I also agree with it on, I go back and I look and I'm like, 
I look at a certain photo, I remember maybe the argument we had before, or maybe the situation that was underlying that was going on right before mm. that event or certain things like that. And I'm like, okay, let me not romanticize this relationship that like there were not things that did not cause my heart to break before my heart ultimately finally broke. Wow. Yeah. There were tiny and there, moments mm -hmm, that led up to like the ultimate thing. And it's like, I was already hanging on by a thread before that even happened. And so it's like, you know, I don't want to, I cannot romanticize the whole thing because it was not all peaches and cream. There were good moments, but there was a lot of, there was other moments. So I have to make sure I'm like, okay, remember both. And I do. <laughs> What is your advice for people who are online, they are on Instagram, they're on social media, they're scrolling around looking at videos and TikToks, et cetera, from couples, and they just feel like that hasn't happened for me yet, that's never happened. Your media might have been among that media. What's your advice for people to have that lens of literacy as they're watching the couples that they, you know, hope to someday be? And stop watching them. <laughs> no, literally. No, I'm so serious because when I think about it, I'm like, you do not know what is going on behind the scenes. You don't, you really, you really honestly do not know. Is this a business arrangement? Do they actually like each other? Like, were they fighting before this? Like, you know, are they, are they even together? Is this fake? Like, we just, we really don't know. And we put out what we want the world to see. And so you're being sold a rhetoric that you want to be sold. And it's like, we're selling ourselves short because your story is going to look completely different, but you're now married to the idea of this thing that's not even real that you've recreated in your head, as opposed to saying like, what does, what should my story look like? Um, it's great to look at people and be like, Oh, I'm, I hope they're, they're in love. I'm glad they're in love. I love that. And I want that too, as opposed to like, I want to be like that couple. It's, I, and this has broke me from that heavily because there's moments where we would post pictures and people would be liking and commenting and all this stuff, whatever. And I'm like, I'm not so happy right now. Things are mm -hmm. not great right now, you know, mm -hmm. and that's the reality of life and how it is. But we want to, we all romanticize what we can see. And we very strategically all do that on social media. Social media yeah. is, a, is a highlight reel. Yeah. Cause I think even, even me, I'm not going to have a moment where I struggle with my partner in, in a healthy relationship that both of us are committed to that we want to be in. I'm not going to have a moment where he and I have a tough conversation and go, this would make a great reel for a comedy loving audience, you know, and then, right. <laughs> and then go publicize, you know, some of our difficult or like, you know, ball in your throat conversations. Like those are necessary and they're going to happen even in the happy relationships and even the healthy relationships, but they're still not going to make the feed. <laughs> like, right. Right. We have, to keep, we have to keep some things private. So I, I do feel you on a little bit of, the duality where you're like, okay, you know, I'm posting about love. I'm publishing about my pursuit and I just had a heartbreaking moment or I'm having a really tough time or he and I are really struggling with this distance, whatever the topic is. You're like, kind of can't bring that to complete strangers. I kind of want to keep that for myself, but I don't want people mm -hmm. to think that it's only peaches and cream. Right. Right. And I think that's yeah. what kind of led me to feeling like, we live such a public existence of our love. And then, and it was like, so we're just going to dip. And, and I even said it to him. I was like, so you're just going to offboard me. Like this, this doesn't exist. Like people aren't going to notice. Like we all saw it. It's, it. We all saw it. And so I just, I literally said, I felt a responsibility to the people who were tied to our story to tell the truth. Yeah, I did. I really did because, you know, and I'm not even saying like he's a horrible, terrible person. Like people do make mistakes, you know, sure. granted, unfortunately, mistakes cause other things to happen. And ultimately, we're no longer together. But it it was something that, you know, a lot of women do experience and something that we don't talk about often. And it, and it takes a lot of us out. And I was just like, OK, this is taking me out. And most people think, you know, I'm pretty positive, like on the holistic space. I'm like, I know somebody else out here is going through the same thing. It does not have the support I have because it wasn't for my community. I would be on the floor crying like every single day. Like, look, it's been a struggle. To the, it's been to a the struggle. degree that you're comfortable, do you want to walk us through what happened in your relationship? Whether it's like how you met this person, mm -hmm. how you decided to commit to start dating, um, and then kind of where things went from there? Yeah, we actually were connected through a mutual friend um, on Instagram. And um, 
I actually had messaged him because I was looking for some books to send my brother, some like mentorship books. He has, he, he was part of a mentorship program for young black men. And, um, I reached out to him about that. I, but I also like du dually was like, he's attractive. And I saw his online presence and I was like, this looks like somebody that I could totally like, you know, invest in, in some way. And I just wanted to connect. So we did connect, we ended up talking on the phone and I tell, I told everybody, I was like, as soon as I talked to him on the phone, I was like, I felt like this is somebody that I could marry. Cause it just seemed like his personality, his character, all of that was like very upstanding. And I was like, wow, like that was a great refreshing conversation. I want to keep having more. And from there, we just started continuing to have FaceTime. We text, you know, talk, yeah. whatever, and got to know each other. Um, about a month and a half into it, um, I was going to Vegas with some friends um, for one of my friend's birthdays and um, I, we were just talking about trips and him coming to visit in California because we he was long distance. We had met each other. Um, but I told him I'd be in Vegas so he can come to California after that if he wanted. He ended up buying a ticket um, and was like, I'm coming to Vegas. And so him and his friend actually came to Vegas and I met him for the first time there. Great time. Um, came back. And then after that, we were like this, like mm. talking every day, FaceTime video, whatever. And very mm -hmm. early on, he was talking about marriage in like. Yeah commitment and all that which is interesting because like he had mentioned that like he wasn't really wanted to titles he had never really posted a woman on his page or anything like that but he was very intent on me and was very much like you're exactly what i prayed for you're exactly mm. what i wanted and i was like same thing i feel the same way and i always felt like when i found that person it would move quickly and i was okay with that because i knew what i wanted i had dated people i didn't need to go through all the mess like i very clear we're adults let's do it and so he ended up coming to California to meet my family. And a week later, I went to uh, St. Louis to meet his family. Y'all were on a momentum. We did. A we were on a momentum. And then we were visiting each other like every every two weeks. Like I would go and spend two weeks in St. Louis. He would spend two weeks in California. We were going back and forth and like Huge commitment. really building a relationship. And then from there, we decided to enroll in pre premarital counseling. So we were not engaged yet. And we did wow. enroll. We were already doing counseling. And so Something for me, about like, you and preparation pause because people need to hear <laughs> she got a what a dating coach. See, my ears not big enough for this. She got yeah, a what a yeah. dating coach. And then she enrolled in pre premarital counseling. Okay. Preparation continue. Yeah. So I thought we, I thought like, we was like, okay, we're like you said, the preparation was there. We're doing all the things. And you know, I, from looking back at it, I see like we moved fast, which I feel like was okay, but there was just some foundational things that were being missed. Um, because his life was picking up and like, as far as business wise and everything, he was very focused on that. And I, but I felt like there wasn't enough attention being focused on the relationship and we were trying to balance things, but there just wasn't as much balance. I feel like there could have been also, mm -hmm. we were dealing with the duality of like, he very much wanted to do the photo shoots and the trips and the things and the matching outfits and all the stuff. And it became a lot. And I just felt, I, I enjoyed it. Cause I was like, Oh my God, I've always wanted this. But then as I was in it, I was like, I feel like, we're spending too much time focusing on this as opposed to focusing wow. on like the relationship. And I just started feeling like I was on a train that was like running away from me. Like, and I was willing to chase it because I wanted to be here, but it was stressful. Mm -hmm. And so we started having these conversations where he was feeling like, Oh, you can't handle my lifestyle. You can't handle how fast I move. But I'm like, no, it's not that. I was Dude, like, I, I just, I value. Yeah, yeah. But I just, can we build some uh, infrastructure on it? <laughs> can we check the yes. oil of the train <laughs> before we keep pushing? It's so interesting because what you're talking about is that he and you started to invest in the appearance of the relationship without the actual meat of it or structure. There's a way that I think when couples get really busy, and this has especially happened like pandemic, et cetera, you're like, okay, yeah, we're meeting up. We're doing the same dinners. We're going on dates. We're calling each other. We're... It's the actions, but not actually the connection. Mm -hmm. And so it's fascinating to me because I think so many people could find themselves in that situation just by virtue of being really busy where you're like, okay, wait, wait, we're dating, but we're not bonding. Right. Or we're dating, but we're not building our trust or building our communication or enhancing our intimacy. No. And I would agree. And that was actually one of my biggest complaints because I was like, look, I, he's very much like, like the structure in that way, business focused and busy, whatever. And so I just felt like, okay, if I involve, I just involve myself, we work together, do all that that's us connecting, but I see now where things were missed and stuff wasn't happening. And I really wish we would have more people who have more eyes on a relationship to just help mm -hmm. us navigate that space. Um, fast forward as you know, when things started taking a turn, um, the months leading up into, you know, me finding out about the infidelity and everything, 
I was complaining about like, I feel like it's a checkbox relationship. Like you're, sh- you're like, we have a standing date night, you know, you invite me over, we talk on the phone, we do these things, but we're not necessarily like connecting, connecting. And like, that's where I was having an issue because I'm like, where is the emotional connection? Like we're missing that, but then we're mm-hmm. checking all the boxes yeah. and, but it wasn't necessarily like translating. So I was like getting frustrated. But then come to find out like later, later, later on, it was like, oh, the moments where we were not connecting, we were connecting with other people. There it was. And I was like, God, and my thing is, is that I didn't necessarily have like understanding on like, that's what was happening. But as a woman, and I always said that I was like, as a woman, your spirit knows, like I just knew something was not right, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Because I had this full trust. I'm like, what is going on? Something is just not right. And I brought that up. I was like, I knew something was going on because there was moments where I'm just like, he's not there. He's not there. Because I'm like, your mind, your heart, your soul, something, you're there with somebody else. Everybody speaks about women's intuition. Like it's this uh, eponymous, euphemistic, it's this thing that's just like circling above our heads of, oh, a woman's intuition. You know, we hear our moms, our aunts, a woman always knows And for women who don't always know or haven't been in a situation like that, it's like, what am I supposed to know? Am I supposed to get a spidey sense on the back of my neck? Is it a feeling? Is it a pattern of recurring thoughts? Is it a, a, you know, ball in my throat? Is it a pit of my stomach? Like, I keep hearing women's intuition and I'm just wondering, like, what that is. Does it manifest differently in all of us? Were we supposed to renew our subscription? Like, Uh, you know, I don't know. Come in the mail. (laughs) Where's mine at? Like, I'm ready to play. I'm, I'm actually curious. I'm not sure how other women experience it. I just know for me, it's like a feel. Like I just, and I, and I wasn't even told them that before. I was like, I don't have all the information, but I feel unsettled. Something's not right. And my mom always used to say that. She'd always be like, something's off. And like my soul cannot rest until I have an answer. And I'm like, so for weeks and weeks and weeks, I was just like, we would argue and go back and forth and things would happen. And I'm like, I just don't feel like we're on the same page. Like, and then we'd have moments where we're cool. And I'm like, something's just not right. But when I found out about the infidelity, it's just like, I I just knew the energy was going somewhere else. I knew it wasn't all coming towards me. And it it unfortunately like gave me confirmation of like, I had peace because I'm like, okay, I can stop. My soul can stop looking for what it's looking for. But now I'm like, oh man. Now I'm hurt. Dang it. Yeah. Yeah, now I found out. <laughs> you now said, I found out that I was like, I was like <laughs> because but I, I could, but, but yeah, you can't ignore it. You can't ignore that energy. Like energy is so big. You can't ignore that when somebody is not putting all their energy where it's supposed to be. You feel like some, it's missing. Can't or even when you, you are putting forth your communication. Cause you said like at multiple points, you're raising, you're asking questions, you're trying to pump the brakes a little bit. Like even when you're putting forth that energy, you're not getting the answer that you need. Like you said, my soul won't rest until it's settled until I have the answer. So by virtue of being unsettled, like you figured it out and you were like, okay, we're going to, we're going to enter a state where I feel emotionally safe, secure, whatever that answer is, just, we're mm-hmm. going to reach a moment of rest. And then I'll know that like all is right. And I'm me again. Right. And then after that, it was panic. It was like, oh my God, like everything just blew up. <gasps> Grab all the pieces and tape it back together. Yeah. You're like, no, 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 no. I didn't need to go poke like, no, no, no. Yeah. It's literally like, I literally felt like that. I was like, you know, when I, when I think about like, if somebody else came to me and told me exactly what happened in my relationship and I was like on the outside, I'd been like, Ooh, no, mm-mm. this is not okay. This is not right. <laughs> What, what for you did the days after infidelity look like? And like, I'll speak to a heartbreak moment to kind of, you know, like when I, when my first relationship ended, it wasn't because of infidelity, but it ended for different reasons. I spent the night crying, the next day crying, just, there was a huge emotional release. There was a dream that was deconstructed. There was a castle that fell down. We weren't engaged. We weren't married, but we had had those similar conversations and it had been seven years of being in that dating state. And like you said, holding on to the outcome, right? Of, yeah. Well, we're all moving towards this. So I spent those first couple of days crying. I watched ice cream. I got calls. I got gifts from friends. Um, I did want to tell people that the relationship was no longer, uh, no longer happening as soon as it ended because I realized that by telling people it would make it real. So it wasn't something I wanted to sit on for two weeks, three weeks. 
did you, and then I, what's crazy and a lot of people, you know, may or may not believe is that I shared in the first episode, like after mm, two weeks of crying, like the release was done. I continue to have moments throughout, you know, the dating process uh, where I think about that, but my feelings, you know, went from raw to like healed pretty quickly. Uh, I would say for seven years, it healed after about two weeks. So for you, what did that, you know, you dated, you were engaged for 10 months? Yeah, we were engaged. Yeah. For, for almost a year. And then all that, all that happened. I, so, I lost my mind. Anything you want to like, share. Yeah. I know. I literally, when I think about it, I, when I tell you, when I found out, I was like, I literally had a panic attack. I had a panic attack and I was like, I can't believe this happening. Like I confronted him about it and like he denied it. And I'm like, wait, no, like I'm, I'm seeing what I'm seeing. I'm going to need you to address this. And it turned in, and that's when it turned into a blame of like, yeah. oh, this is your fault. And now wow. you're angry. And I'm like, whoa, not only did I just find out about this heartbreaking thing, but now he's angry at me and I'm being blamed for it. And now I'm like, wait, is this my fault? And it turned into that. And so I didn't know what to do with that. I'm by, I'm, you know, by myself halfway across the country for the first time. And so I'm like, I need support. And I'm just like, who do I turn to? So I did reach out to his mom and um, his two sisters and share with them what was going on. And they were equally as shocked. And then once he found out I did that, oh, he was very upset. Huh. And I understand, I understand why, but I also was like, I needed, I needed emotional support. And I wasn't necessarily telling people because I wanted it to be over. I think I was telling people so that people can be like, Oh no, he's a good guy. You're good. Like everything's fine. Like it'll be fine. You wanted people it'll to be help fine. you pick those pieces back up to reconstruct I did. what was breaking. And the, and the more I was handing people pieces and people were like, I'm trying to put it together, but I don't have nothing to put together. I'm like, okay, let me go to the next person and let, let me have them here. Look at the pieces. Tell me, can you put, can you fix this? It was like a doctor. Like, can you fix this? And it was like, nobody could fix it. And I'm like, except for the person that needed to fix it. And, and he wasn't talking to me. He wouldn't yeah. speak to me. And every time he talked to me, he was putting aggression on me. And so I'm like, okay, how do I know? I've never been in this situation before. Not only am I, have I been cheated on, am I currently being cheated on, but now I'm being blamed. And I'm like, this is a mind mess. Like I didn't know how to deal with it. And I just, so I was very emotional. I was depressed. I didn't, wasn't eating, wasn't sleeping. Mm. Um, I was very isolated. Uh, I lost 15 pounds. In like, oh my gosh. And like, you're talking about relationship weight. You said goodbye. No, I did. I wasn't eating. I literally could not eat. I couldn't keep anything down. I was just, just distraught. This yeah. literally sat me on the ground and I just kept looking to him to be like, okay, just wake up and be like, I messed up and I'm so sorry. And let's work towards it. Let's get back into counseling or whatever. And it's just like, that just wasn't happening. And I was like, so what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to just let this go? Am I supposed to like, like, I feel hurt. I want to be redeemed. I want my feelings acknowledged. I want to be told, like, yes. you are enough. And I did and I did this, but, like, I want to make it up to you. But, I mean, that's not what was happening. Yeah. With it was, no one. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, with no one there to, quote, unquote, rescue you. Like, you're almost walking around, operation, operation, like, help, help, help. Did you pull yourself out? No, I had some, some really good people around me, some... um some women of faith and some close friends of faith um, who really were just like, like when I tell you, like they were calling me, checking on me, like, wow. look, we, we, we got about to make sure that you don't not make it through this because this was, I was like, what am I supposed to do? You know? And I ended up at, at one point going home for 10 days to California to just regroup. And when I tell you, I literally just slept in, in, in the room. Like I was just a teenager and yeah. like did nothing for like 10 days. Like, yeah. Returning you know, to just child gained... a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. I did. I was like, oh, this is nice. Like I really needed to do that. And then, um, I ended up going to visit another friend in Atlanta and she, you know, was there for me in that space. And she had also, you know, experienced this similar thing in her life. And so she was there. So I just really had people who, who like created space for me to grieve. Um, which Come I'm on, very, women. very appreciative. No, literally, like, my community was very much there for me. And I'm like, I appreciate y'all because when I tell you, I was like, I don't know where my head had been for, like, months. And, but they just kept showing up. They kept showing up. And I think that's why so heavily I was like, I need to share my story because there's somebody out there who did, who was not lucky like me, who did not have community, who did not have sound people, who were willing to talk to them. Because it's like, 
my ex was like very upset that I was talking to people. But the thing is that we weren't, we weren't just, man, he's a trash dude. Blah. Right, like, yeah. We weren't doing that. It was, we love you. We know you love him. Like, how can we help you work through this so that you can be okay? Like we did yes. not spend time like bashing him. It was like, help me talk through this. So I know how to manage. Like I'm trying to get through this. I'm trying to be here. And like, I, we just, I just had hope that like things would turn around. And so most people don't have that community. Right. And so I'm like, okay, maybe I can at least be that voice in words for somebody who's um, in the bed and can't leave, but might read the words and be like, okay, I'm going to get up today. And it sounds like that's what like surviving the split is about is like, let's mm-hmm. rationalize our way through this. Because if we mm-hmm. let ourselves go to, I mean, a little hysteria is necessary sometimes, but if we, if yeah. we let ourselves devolve into hysteria, into blame game, into the, we're just going to lose who we are. But if we can mm-hmm. talk through, rationalize, recognize everyone's human, everyone makes mistakes. Sometimes things just change. People change. Feelings change. Sorry. It sounded like, uh, come and see me for once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if, if we can just, if we can rationalize through it, like we might actually survive this. You chose to stay because you wanted to try to look inward. You wrote in Faith Filled Them how you took some time to be like, okay, is it me? Is it something that I need to do? Is it something I should work through to repair this? Sorry, I messed up. Like you took a lot of that personally on. And then you were like, it, it, no, nope. you know, exit here, like little, <laughs> like, bye. How has your faith around dating and relationships changed um, and been either shaken or restored by what you've gone through since? Um, and it wasn't as cut and dry. Um, it was a little messy, a little messier than that. Um, Sometimes it was kind of like I, it was, yeah, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it, was a little, it was a little messier than that, but I, I, I feel like before I was, I, like I said, I was very committed to the outcome and to him and to, like I said, proving, cause it got to the point where it was like, now not only did, was I unfaithful because I wasn't happy, but I wasn't happy because you are not what I thought you were and I don't want you. And I'm, and I was like, Oh wait, no, like, but I am that person. Like, let me show you I'm that person. And he kept telling me you're not that person. I kept trying to prove that it was. And so I feel like I allowed him in the words of one of my therapists to put the price tag on me. And the price was pretty low and I let him keep it there for a minute. And it wasn't until I went home to California and like, you know, was visiting with friends and really was reminded like who I am. And I'm like, why am I letting somebody treat me? Like I'm not pressured. Like you could be great, but I'm also great too. And like, don't sure. act like, don't act like I'm not an equally great part of this relationship, but I let him, you know, minimize me to something that I wasn't. And I was operating as if like I was begging for love at this point. And I was like, Oh, this is not, this is not mm-hmm. it. And so like my mindset now is like, I do very much want to operate in a space where like, no, you definitely do need to earn the space that you are in with me. And the moment you no longer are going to respect that space, thank you so much for your time. I am not going to beg you for it because uh, I literally told this to my friend, I was like, yeah, like I was told a long time ago, don't let a man tell you he don't want you twice. And I, I, let him, I let him tell me that a lot of times and what I will do in the future is when people tell me and show me who they are, I will thank leave. them for their time and leave. But I just, I always thought that because I'm so nice and like, I'm a fixer and I'm just, I can fix it. Wow. Wait a minute. We're good. We can fix it. We can fix this. I can fix me. We can fix Bob me. the builder. Can like, she look, fix it? I had, yes, she can. Yeah, all the tape. Give me the duct tape. Like, look, glue. Put the goggles on. Like, let's get to work. We gonna fix it. And it was <laughs> not like, goggles, actually, not not yeah, hazmat, like, not PPE, PPE <gasps> fixing. <laughs> no, literally, I was out here using all the things, looking a looking a mess. As opposed, and and when I looked around, and I realized, no, <laughs> literally, it was. Like, Why did I, you I say goggles? <laughs> because I was just thinking, like, you know, when we you know when those. Um, oh my god, I can't even think of the the name, but they have those little. Um, <laughs> Because uh, when, when they when they when they use the fire and they like solder things together oh, yeah, and they have hey. like the goggles on. Yeah. I don't even know what the I don't That's even not remember even goggles. Job they have is. like a whole helmet. You talk about true, very you true. the type of fixer. You like I, I got a whole helmet. You were welding. 
Oh, you're there not just go. fixing, there we you're go. rebuilding. We're rebuilding. I was creating Look at, a You whole, were forging. I was, I was you said, forging, let me, yeah. Let me enter the forge. And that's not even, and that's not even my, uh, my skill set. I was like, what? This is a mess. Just, just a whole mess. But yeah, no, I realized that I was just doing too, I was just doing too much. Doing like, too much. I, I was just doing too much. Like, like I said, like I, I was very hurt. And like I said, like, I do, I don't hate him. I don't hate him. Like I still love him. I just realized that, you know, if somebody don't love you, they don't love you. Right. You know? You're not being loved in the way that you deserve was, to be loved. And so I just had to unfortunately let it go and it sucked, but I should have let it go a lot sooner. But I was just like, no, like you're wrong. You do love me because yeah. I was, I truly believed that we were supposed to be together. Um, he just lost the that desire. That. Yeah. He lost the faith in that. And like, I just, just can't force people. Um, I thought I could. <laughs> It's probably the biggest lesson is they stop trying to force people to do stuff that they don't want to do. You can't force people to do stuff they don't want to do. No, literally. Cry sometimes. Just keep your helmet on. <laughs> You'll avoid the sparks. Hey. Okay. Uh, how how are you feeling telling this story? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Because it's like, it's, it's, I was, that's how I felt even like writing it. I just, I was so like pent up and I was just like, I feel all these things. And like, you know, like I said, we've lived very publicly and I feel like that's the thing. It's like, we live very publicly, but then we want to dismiss privately. And I just don't believe that. I just felt like dismissed. And I'm like, I do want to say something. I do want to honor my story in a graceful way because I did not, there's a lot of stuff that I did not share that did not need to be on the internet. How it does not need to, yeah, it does not need to be on the internet um, at all. Um, but I did feel like I at least owed it to myself to share my piece of my story because, uh, like, we had this very public love story. It's like, what's going on? You know? But just, I, I, I am still thinking of that, like I said, in the space of I can talk about it without having hatred, without having, like, he's a trash dude, whatever, because yeah. I don't think he's trash. I do think he made a lot of mistakes that I'm very unhappy about. And I wish he hadn't have made because I wanted to marry this man and have a family with him. on the outcome. Yeah, but this is where we are. And so I am taking it day by day and in the space of you can share your story and have love for somebody and it doesn't have to cancel out the two because my experience is my experience just like his is his that doesn't mean i don't love you however this is what your behavior did to me absolutely and i and i do feel like i have a i can honor myself in sharing that and yep, that's how i'm grieving too. and processing and moving through so it's not a shade to him it's a this is my life <laughs> I feel like you're just sitting in silence. I'm like, yeah. I like I feel I feel like I'm that that character behind you in high school that's got like her hand on her hip. He's like, yeah, what she said. No, absolutely. Mm. And <laughs> it's very encouraging to hear how affirming, um, how awake you are right now. Like y'all speaking to me. You're not speaking to me like somebody is asleep. You're speaking to me like someone is very awake. <laughs> and aware and you're like i'm back i'm grounded i know i'm not gonna let somebody tell me that twice um the last question i'll ask you before we go into our game is are you open to dating and monogamy in the future or has this changed any of your goals At, when i was when i was still in the thick of it because i still feel like i'm healing out of it when i was in the thick of it i was like oh, i'll never love again i won't trust anybody like don't anybody look at me talk to me yeah and I was like, I'll just be single forever and be the rich auntie and like sail off into the sunset. And then I really had to have a, take a moment because, um, you know, in my, in the Facebook fam blog, like I started that because I'm very interested and had done all the study on femininity and talking about how as women, we are naturally created to be connectors, nurturers, like be in a relationship, those types of things. We tend to put up walls and stop wanting to do that when we get, when we get wounded. And so my thing is, is that. I do not want to be in a space to where I don't want to get married because I've been wounded. If I didn't want to get married just because that's cool, but it's because I'm wounded. And yeah. so my thing was like, I don't want to be in that space. Like I do want to heal and be in a place where I can 
allow the right person to love me the way I need yep. to be loved. And I'm very much believing that God made me this way. And that there's gotta be somebody out there who can love me this way. And I thought it was him. And if it's not, then this, there's somebody else out there. And I'm like, okay, you know, it is hard because I'll be 33 in February. And, you know, I thought I was off. I didn't, thought I didn't have to be back in the streets. And now I'm back in the streets. And I'm like, wait, we wasn't supposed to be back in the streets. Yeah, da, dee, da, dee, da, back to the streets. But we are well, here. The thing about the, yeah. you know, black women, this 30-ness that we have of by which time you should already be boo, boo, boo. But obviously God has a plan, which is not what somebody wants to hear. But I'm echoing you. You're like, God has a plan for my life. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm. I'm becoming, this year has become a pivot year. I've normally very type A, normally very structured. And this entire year has been like, oh, we got to th- pull the rug from under you. And I'm like, wait a minute, was it ready? But now I'm like, okay, fine. If I have to be here, I was literally cracking up with my friends. And I was like, look, I've been, I literally have been the Jonah of my life. Like God tells me to do this. So I'm like, I'm gonna go this way. And then he still snatches me back. And so I'm like, I'm tired of feeling like, I know God's gonna God's gonna take me there anyway, so I would God is like if you don't of, get your yeah instead of being dragged because when He drags you, you get scraped up. You'll get there, but you'll be scraped up. But if I walked over there, I wow. have less scrapes. So I'm like, let me just walk. I'm gonna walk. I'm like, I'm coming this time. I'm gonna walk. So this well, is so gonna walk. Tell everybody where you're walking because I'm sure they want to walk the same way. Where are you walking? What's the GPS, <laughs> What's the GPS Honestly, coordinates? So wait, where, where you're walking? Where where, where are we going? Honestly, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm walking towards where God wants me to be. I feel like I'm the same place as you where I've spent my whole life saying, oh, this creative space, writing, dancing, that's, that's a side thing, get a job, yeah. corporate America, whatever, whatever. But that's not who I was created to be. I was wired to create. I was wired wow. to dance, to write, to those things. Did not think I could make a living out of it. And this blog, God put it on my heart like months ago. And I wouldn't start it. And when I tell you when I wrote this post, I didn't think this was going to be the first post I was going to write. But he literally was like, write the post. And I wrote it and I was like... I need to be writing more. I mean, and, and I'm dancing now. I need to be dancing more. That is how I connect with God, how I connect with the world, how I communicate with people and connect. And I feel like that is where I'm walking in that direction towards more of those things. So you'll be seeing me do more of those things. Yes. Okay. Remind people where they can find you. Shout out the website and spell it for them. Absolutely. It's the faithfilledfem.com, um, F-E-M-M-E.com. Um, yeah, and that is my blog. Know. Yes. First, the faithfilledfem.com. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. It is the end of the show. So, Bridget, we're going to play our favorite game. What's more unsettling? Yay! <laughs> Woo! Mild applause. Okay. So, what is more unsettling? Living a public life online and a private life of stress? Or convincing somebody that they are wrong about you. Again, our options are living a public life online and a private life of stress. Or is it more unsettling to convince somebody that they are wrong about you? Bridget, what's your answer? I would say the convincing somebody that they're wrong about you, because at this point I'm laying it all out there and begging them to accept who I was created to be, as opposed to them already seeing that in my therapist's words, I am the gift. I know that's right. Okay, Dana, <laughs> what do you think is more unsettling? Chime in with your thoughts on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, or TikTok with hashtag dating unsettled, or just mention us at dating unsettled and have a happy dating. Thank you for listening, Unsettlers. Please follow Dating Unsettled for weekly episodes wherever podcasts are found so you don't miss an episode of your new favorite show. If you can't get enough of me, subscribe to my newsletter at datingunsettled.com. DM me your dating stories, your reactions to the story that you heard. If this resonates with you on Instagram at Dating Unsettled, I want to know how it's going for you, and I will see you next week. Dating Unsettled.